And those from this side, Isa and you take 1393-22229. And essentially, you should be able to see. Um, okay, you take the other one. Never, never mind. And you select. I'm just that. Uh, bef put, a, put a zero before the numbers I give you and put a one if you are on this side of the road. Sorry about this. And I hope that everyone can uh, log in. So this is, and there is a user for me. So basically, I'm going to continue sharing this. Zero five. OK. And uh, so, OK. Where is this? Where am I? Oh my God. So, so let me take this second one. Okay, so what you should see here, HTTP and you get slash slash, HTTP colon colon slash slash colon colon 8787. Okay. And then you should get this prompt, log into our studio. I'm going to enter with my prompt, but you could uh, OEMC slash zero one zero two. I'm just I'm just uh, getting which one do you have, Wolfgang? Uh, the two huh? The but the user OEMC one. one zero one zero two zero three zero four zero five fifteen sixteen seventeen. Can it be this way? No, I mean, if you're logged in, never mind. It's just that I don't want, uh, conf if you get a conflict, you will get you a different number. Okay, and what is my password? Okay. Uh, this is my password. Okay. Now, since you're here, you should get an RStudio prompt. Like I was telling before, we decided, and of course you can make, if you're not familiar with our studio, you can, for example, increase the appearance to 14, apply, okay. So you go to tools, the first thing you should get, you should get a prompt like this, and you should, if you want it's too small, you can go tools, global options. Okay, so that's, if everybody has got this page, and let me explain why we chose to do that again. We have demos on Kaggle, but we decided to do it this way to make it easier for you to um, make it easier for you not to have to disclose any information to Kaggle or to Google Colab, so you'll be open to do it. Now, let me then ask you to go to Google and type the following word, sits book, sits book. And you should get, not perhaps not on the first, but the first non-sponsored, you should get this book, okay? So this is the online book which we have developed for the SITS package. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very comprehensive book and it's organized in the following way. There are chapters. Each chapter covers a certain point, certain issue here. So if you click on introduction, for example, there are discussions here on the introduction. And at a certain point, there will be a code <coughs> which you then copy and paste into your RStudio window. Okay? So, let me propose as a very starting point that if you all are on the page, you go to the introduction section, which is this one, and you click on the clipboard 
which should be here. Okay. Click on the clipboard. And when you go back to your tab with the RStudio, okay, you have to click again on this very small, these two windows here, so you get a window where you can uh, write code. If I hope that you all saw the fact that there is a small, small, um, here, small place where you can uh, write source code on our studio. Okay, where is this? Why is this not doing this what I want? Oh, come on. Oops, I did too much. Okay. Okay, so if you're following this, you should have a place where you put code and there is a place where you have uh, the terminal. So if you've not seen this, please shout. Okay, and then at this point, you can copy the code that you just saw on the introduction section of the software, copy to clipboard, and you can go back to your RStudio server window, okay, and you can basically run the code. And I'm going to explain step by step because I want to start with the provocative question to Professor Fagner. So let's just hope that you can run. Uh, you, you go step by step, you click on the, on the you do, no, I'm sorry, you, you write source. And uh, please change if you someone else is using the same user. There's plenty of usernames available, so you can start from the last one, for example, which machine you are. Yeah, uh, yes, you're using uh, zero 02. Okay, is, is anyone else using zero 02? No. So, uh, Brian, try which machine are you? Okay. Okay, Brian, 50, go, go to 52, 164, 224, 193. Okay, and then try OEMC35, and, this, and the password is tom.hangle. You can never forget this password. Okay. Right. Because if you manage to, let's, I'm going to do it step by step, it's easier. So in R, the first, uh, hopes the pointer should die, please. The first uh, uh, line called library tibo basically loads a library. I, I suppose that you're more familiar with Python than with R. Is there anyone who's familiar with R? Oh, lots of, more or less, okay. So library Tibo, Tibo is a library. Library sits, sits is the library that we're going to discuss. And sits data is the library that we have provided uh, as a companion library to the book. And this uh, library contains lots of examples. Now, Okay, come in, come in, don't, don't be shy. There's places, pl plenty of places here in front. Okay, no, 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 come on. Uh, please uh, sit on the front and open your laptop. Come on, come in, you're welcome. Please sit on the front and open your laptop. There's no need that you should be shy. Okay. In fact, we should be starting by now, but we're taking the the extra minutes to set everybody up. So uh, for those ladies who just come down, please uh, do the following. Uh, please uh, uh, go, please go to, 
the following address, HTTP, look on the screen, 52, HTTP slash slash 52, 164, 224, 193, colon, 87, 87. So, again, HTTP 52, 164, 224, 193, colon, 87, 87. If you get this right, you should get a prompt for an R Studio server password. Fifth, HTTP 52 164 224 193. HTTP, not HTTPS. Okay? And you should get a prompt, right? If you don't get a prompt, it's because you got the wrong address. Colon. It's important to put colon 8787. Did you get the prompt to log in? Okay. Okay, you do get a prompt. Okay. I don't. Okay. Ofi, pede ela para entrar com ask her to go uh, twenty and twenty one. Okay. For the others. Could you then, we are loading. So what we did up to now was load two libraries. And if you're still with us, we are on line seven. On line seven, there's a comment which is uh, the source of, uh, of it's, I hope it's the starting point of a very good discussion. 52 20 e 21 é o OMC 15 até 35 20 and 21 OMC 20 and the second please OMC 21 and then the password is Tom dot hango and then you should see a Okay, and what you should get, okay, step by step. Okay, okay, now step. And then you, what you should get, you should get the console. Robert, Rolf, Rolf, por favor, pede para abrir o terminal. Please ask her to open the terminal. Please, thank you. So, 22, 23. Okay, for the latecomers, last chance. Okay, the, what we're doing here is we have created, because of, uh, okay. Has anyone got 12? No one's got 12. Anyone's got, because, just to get everybody on board, we had created two virtual machines. Two virtual machines. The two virtual machines, they have different addresses. One virtual machine has address 1393-222-29. The other virtual machine has address 52-164-224. 193. Okay? To get access to the RStudio server, you should write HTTP 
like I have here on my machine, HTTP, okay, so you need to write something like HTTP, precede this with HTTP, colon, slash, slash, the number, and then you do a colon again and take 87, 87. So let me show you, for those of you, let me get a PowerPoint. Huh? Oh, yes, Diego, thank you very much. So you, like this, HTTP, colon, and let me make this very big. The user is not the one. Huh? And then, okay, and then there's a second machine which the late, I, I asked the late comments to log into the second machine, which is this one, this one, HTTP slash slash 8787. And now on this machine, you should have users OEMC 01, to OEMC 15, but most of these have been taken by the, the already people in the room. On the second machine, you have users OEMC 15 until OEMC 35. I suppose if you try 30, 31, 32, they are not taken. Each one of you should have a separate user not to conflict with the others. The password for everyone is tom.hangle. How could it be otherwise? And I would like someone who has not been able to connect to give me a shout. So hearing silence in the room, I, we can proceed. Okay, so it's now 11.42, we have until 12.30, we had about 50 minutes. Okay, so can we now start? Good. So what I was telling you before, those of you, some of you have been already to this point, is that we have created a long line book with the SITS package. The online book is easily accessible with the simple prompt on Google called SITS book. If you write SITS book on a Google prompt, you should immediately get, after you jump the sponsored pages, to the page where there's an online book. And it's important because those of you who like, of course, this course is just an appetizer for the online book. The online book has been three years in the making. And of course, it contains a lot of detail, which would be impossible to cover on the course. Okay, now let me explain what the SITS package is. The SITS package is meant to be an end-to-end -end environment. It's not a tool in the proper sense that, for example, Xcube is a tool or Xarray is a tool. It is a package that is meant to be used for land use, land cover assessment of Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Landsat data, and provides you with an end-to-end -end environment. In other words, you should be able to get data from a data cube, train time series, process time series, post-process the time series, produce the maps, get analysis, do OBIA, so it's not a tool, we, it, it's an end user tool. It's meant to be used by end users. Of course, developers are welcome to contribute. But if I would like then to show, if you understand this, you can leave the room now. 
because uh, the rest is easy. So let me explain what is the logic behind the package. The logic behind the package is very simple. It is built around four abstractions in the sense of processing abstraction. A critical abstraction is called a data cube. And, and the next, OK? And then we're going to discuss what a data cube is. For the moment, think of a data cube as a data cube in your mind. But there's a little bit. So the data cube is a collection of satellite images organized in a certain space. We'll go for more for that. But in, in, in conceptually, it is this. The other abstraction is called, and here the data cube can be Landsat, Sentinel, Sentinel Landsat, Sentinel 1, Sentinel 2, DEM, uh, Sentinel Soy Monster, whatever. The data cube contains this, the, the only restriction that it covers the uh, uh, same geographical. It doesn't even have to be, and going back to the excellent uh, lecture by Wolfgang, it doesn't even have to be the same projection. You can have multiple tiles in a data cube. I'll back to that in a moment. The other abstraction is called samples. Samples is actually what you have, samples, a sample. In this case, a sample may be a sample with a point and a label, but more typically, it's a point, a label, and a time series. Abstraction number three is a model. So unlike, for example, EOLEARN or many EO, uh, open EO other packages, these packages have separate, and Xcube, for example, they have separate functions, one for machine, one for random forest, one for SVM, one for XBoost, one for LightGBM. No, there's one function called sits train. Sits train trains a model. And then, if you run samples and a model, you get a trained model. It's a, an abstraction. Internally, they're represented completely separately different, but the user doesn't need to know that. He has a model. And of course, if he applies the model to the cube, he gets a probability cube. So for him, you don't have to use one specific training for random forest, one specific function for light GBM one specific function for attention-based models. Just sit straight. And then when you go to the result, the result is a probability cube. Unlike Google, if you use the Google Earth Engine, which I assume most everybody here, what you get, you don't get probability cubes out of Google Earth Engine by default. You get yes, no cubes sometimes, but you don't get a full probability cube in the sense of a probability for each class. And because of that, you cannot do post-processing. So we've developed functions for smoothing, which are functions that allow post-processing of the data. We have a Bayesian algorithm for smoothing. And then you produce. There's more to it, but if you understand this logic, you can write code in five minutes. So the logic is complicated to program internally, simple to use. Now, if we now go to the book, and like I said, if you pick, if you, the book is organized as a click, uh, control C, control V. So if you go to the introduction section of the book, you will see at a certain moment a function called creating a data cube. Okay? Now, if you now click on this copy to clipboard, and we were just before most people arrived, into paste this into your R Studio. If you're able to do that, you're in business. If you're not, shout because Hof will help you. My dear friend Hof is always very nice to help you. For those of you who are there, 
this uh, small snippet of code consists of five functions. Okay. Uh, here we, li we load the library, Tibble, which is a, a standard library in, uh, in R. We, hold, we load two libraries here, so you can please uh, run each line of code. Click on run. You and then we were in the point of uh, doing something here called a function called sits cube. And now things get interesting because the sets cube is a function that now does something. In this case, it is retrieving data which is in your, in this case, your machines because we've loaded to your machine. Each one of you has access to this library. So the data is on this directory here. Okay. And uh, the parse info is basically, since the data consists on TIFF files, it's just to tell the system what, in which order it we should get the information. Okay. And if you all are able to run line number seven, you should get an object called a cube. And if you type in your terminal, synop cube, you have something. You have an information on a data cube, which, yes? The data currently at this point is on this directory. But, well, it's in this case locally. I will get to it because now, in this case, it's downloaded. Doesn't have to be. We'll we'll get to that in a second. In this case, for this f first example, is in laptop. Now, the cube structure, Wolfgang. Here, if you if you look here, there's a sensor collection, source collection, satellite sensor, tile X min X max CRS. Okay, and then there is one more thing called file info. What does it mean? Source is where you get it. BDC, OEDC, uh, and which collection, which collection of the data, which satellite, which tile. Like I said, it can be in multiple tiles. Doesn't need to be a single tile. Which tile, which CRS, which X mean, X max. And then if you type synop underscore cube dollar file underscore info, uh, brackets, brackets, one, you get the answer to your question, Wolfgang. This is the list of files which comprise the data cube. Now, what you see here <coughs> is a list of files with information on bands, information on dates, information rows, columns, resolution, uh, X mean, CRS, again, the CRSs don't have to be the same, and uh, 36 more rows, which means this is a time series, and path. So again, if you go again and, and repeat the information, synop cube dollar file info, brackets, brackets, one, dollar, path, brackets, brackets, one, you finally find out the information that uh, I was trying to hide from Professor Wagner. It is local. Okay? But we'll get to that in a second because I have a good question for Professor Wagner. But for the moment, let's agree that this is a data structure that holds data cubes. The path can be a path an S3 path. This data cube can be on Amazon. It can be on Copernicus data space ecosystem. It can be on whatever. Any place that has a stack interface or has a file access. A user, again, we try to hide as much information <laughs> for the user as possible because, our, again, our users are not programmers. Finally, for this example, 
finally for this example, we have line 15, which is the simplest thing possible, which is a plot. Okay, and uh, the plot here is a little bit export, uh, let's see, zoom. Okay, so this is the plot. Strange because I think they don't have the, never mind, it's the plot there. And there's, uh, I think there's, uh, there was a, those of you who are into R know there is a package called Tmap which is underscoring some changes and that's why this is a problem with Tmap which is not a problem with, with SITS but uh, it will get fixed eventually. So this is a plot with a plot of an NDVI of a certain date and you have lots of examples of plots that you can do with different dates. Okay, you may want to argue, and I hope that we can go back to, before we go to the next step, before we go to the next step, let's do the following. Before we go, we, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to invite you to follow with me because I'm not going to go directly. Uh, please, could you please go back to the page where you have the page or the tab where you have, uh, sorry, what happens here? Uh, there should be a tab, exercise. There should be a tab where you have stored the book. Do you all have this tab? Okay, could you please click on the second chapter, which is called Earth Observation Data Cubes. Okay, that's where I want to refer to Professor Wagner's uh, lecture this morning, where he was referring to the problem that we have nowadays, and let me explain what this problem is. Uh, currently, if you now go to the Sentinel, any Sentinel archive, any place that has a Sentinel-2 archive, you will, people will tell you, well, the Sentinel-2 is following a, an MGRS styling system. And Wolfgang has a paper and he has argued the MGRS styling system, which is based on UTM, is wasteful of space because it duplicates, sometimes gets tricky, but that's what we have. Now, it is the time to ask you, what is a data cube? What in your mind, and please be frank, I don't expect a single or correct answer. What do you think a data cube is? I'm even going to put uh, a figure here, but I, don't, what do you think? Come on, any, any guesses? It's, it's what? I'm sorry? Organization it's a multi-dimensional organization of data, but let me put it this way. What are the dimensions? Any dimensions on the, or? That's, that, very good point. There's, debate on this. When people say Earth's observation data cube, you have different definitions, okay? Some people say the dimensions are latitude, longitude, and time, and then you have attributes as different attributes for each point. That's one definition, so it's multi-dimension, but it's organized around latitude, longitude, and time. Now, any other definitions? Who is familiar with X-Array here or X-Cube? Okay, question. Is an X-Array a, uh, is, is X a data cube? Like it is in Pangeo. No, no, okay. No, because if you, if you, if you get the X-Cube definition, X-Cube is an X-Array. Uh, uh, in Pangeo and, and those who work with open data cube, uh, you translate 
If you write in Open Data Cube or in PangeU, Data Cube, you get an X array. So the question is, is an X array a Data Cube? Or not? W why not? Well, uh, what, what, okay, the problem there is the following. An X-ray is a particular simplification of a data cube, which where all of the data is managed by a single set of coordinates, latitude, longitude, and time. Okay? In that sense, it's a restricted data cube. But you could argue... And what happens, for example, if I have all of this? Can I put all, if, say, for example, the Amazon, 4 million square kilometers, bigger than Europe, can I make a, da a single data cube out of the Amazon? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes. Can how? Yeah, you can extend, but w which system does allow you to have this inside it? The question is where, what you can do as a programmer and what the, sys the tools that we have available allow you to do. Can you do this in OpenEO? The answer is no. Can you do this on, on, on Open Data Cube? The answer is no. Because the... X, the OpenEO is based on ESS's definition of a data cube, and ESS's definition of a data cube is all the latitudes, the, all the spatial elements of a data cube are in the same projection. So in OpenEO, strict OpenEO, you don't have this idea that you can have a data cube consisting of various tiles. Right, Hof? Yep. So you cannot use an open, open EO to classify the Amazon. Okay, so this is a good question. I'm not saying there is a right definition. I'm just saying data cubes come in various shapes and forms. In SITS, we have a problem. SITS was not developed for Europe. SITS was developed for the Amazon and for Brazil, which is a big country, double of Europe. So for us, a data cube is an abstraction. So for example, you can get a data cube as simple as a Sentinel tile, ask it on Microsoft or Copernicus, or as big as you want, as big as the Earth. You can say, I want all the tiles of Sentinel in a single data cube. If you're running on a Vienna supercomputer, that's fine. It will process one tile after the other. So what you're saying, what's the name of uh, you, uh, the, the one? Yeah. Daniel, yeah, but what can I say? Which system supports multiple data cubes? Which software? I mean, it's not that you, the, 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 there's a clear definition here, and perhaps you were not here in the beginning, when I said this is not for programmers. <coughs> this is for users. And my user does not know how to transform an X array with multiple things. He wants to say, I have a polygon here which compresses the whole 2 million square kilometers. I want this to be a data cube. I will argue that for this scale, there are very specific use, use cases. And I think only scientists are interested. I mean, well, and, well, I bet. And most of the people that, sorry, most of the people that work in geostatistics, I mean, when you want to map the entire Amazon, for sure, you will have to know a bit of programming. Otherwise, no. it will be tough. No, no, no. Our users, we have, I'm sorry, but this is not true. We have real users doing the Amazon without programming, using sets. We have still, users. I mean, still, I mean, when you define the data cube, you have a function, you, you even say. No, 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 no. You, when you def that, that's the difference between Python and R. This is the, this is the, 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 there's a big difference between Python and R. In R, you deal with abstractions. In Python, we deal with functions. So when you define, let's go back to our example, which is on the screen here. 
this is an abstract, this is, uh, the function data cube produces an abstraction called a cube. So you deal with the abstraction cube, okay? It's hard to do this in Python. That's the problem. Well, okay, fair enough. I'm not going uh, do. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to be corrected at any time, provided I get an example that works. No, not now, please. I understand. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I'm not aware of a single system that does it in. The, let's put it this way, the current ODC open data cube specification, the current open EO specification. I'm not saying open EO cannot be extended to do it. I'm saying the current specification of open EO cannot do it. Okay, fair enough. Point taken. Could you, I, 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 I'm willing to accept your position as true. But uh, no, I have no, no means of debating it. So let me just go a little bit further and ask you, on the interest of time, to move a little bit down in the introduction of the book to get uh, the part where I say uh, the time series table. There is a, if you down here, this, if you follow me, you are here in the, the same place which I'm showing in the screen. <coughs> and you are invited to copy this small bit here to the clipboard. And you are, of course, invited to paste this on the screen. And here, uh, again, it's just for the sake, you should get four lines of code which is what exactly you have clipped. And at the moment, these four lines of code, basically two of them are redundant with the previous code, doesn't matter. It one says uh, load the library, which you have already loaded just for security's sake. Run the other library, make the state available. And now we got something interesting. Samples Mato Grosso mode 13 Q1. Okay, now we got something different. This is where uh, the fun starts. This is a, s remember that I explained that once you have understood the four abstractions of, of, of sets, you understand everything. So I explained more or less what is the first abstraction, which is cube. And then I'm now explaining what is the second abstraction, which is samples. Okay. And the second abstraction, which is samples, is what it means to be samples. But they're not samples in the traditional, very much, uh, let's say, spatial SQL sense, because they have something more to them which is the time series. So you see here when you type samples Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso is a state in Brazil, mode 13Q1 is, a, is, is the product, mode is 13Q1, and you will see samples, latitude, longitude, start date, end date, label, cube, time series. So what's happening here? There is something which should be, of course, uh, familiar to most of you that work with machine learning, which is the latitude, longitude, and the label. This is the standard samples that you might be using to classify anything on Google Earth Engine or whatever. But what's not canonical? Canonical in the sense that, you know, it's the notion of dates. So here, each sample has a start date, an end date, and a time series. So if you now write the same samples, Mato Grosso, mode 13Q1, dollar, time, underscore, series, um, um, sorry, brackets, brackets, one, okay? 
lo and behold, you have a time series. So the time series, and say, what's the use of this? Um, I think everyone had saw a magnificent lecture by, by Wolfgang saw that the time series is absolutely crucial in many applications. And in land use and land cover, I would argue, not only for land use and land cover, but, but certainly for agriculture, for forestry, time series are crucial. And time series, of course, are very much enabled by having lots and lots and lots of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data sets. So, the idea here is that there is a time series associated with each sample. Yes, please. Um, no, for one reason, and I refer again to Wolfgang's uh, lecture, he says, I need a data cube, an organized data cube for use my analytics and my machine learning. If the things are not organized nicely, most of my analytical and machine learning functions will fail. You can design uh, some functions which are resilient to different times, but that's not the normal. I mean, normal like random forest or, or, or temporal machine learning would require the times to be uh, in the data cube to be consistent. So the key here is that you have a data cube, you have the samples, and the samples are consistent with the data cube. And the way we do this in SITS is by m building the cube first. So back again to our famous diagram. The first thing you do, you build a data cube. Okay? So you build a data cube and then you make it regular. That's the second point. After you make it regular, what you do, you say, I have these points, or shape files, or whatever, CSVs, and I want to extract the time series. So here, there's a function. I'm not going, that's why I'm putting so much emphasis on the diagram, because time prevents me to go into detail. There will be a function called sits get data. And the sets get data, given a latitude, longitude, or a shape file, for example, will get you the time series, would recover the time series from the cube. So the crucial bit here is building the data cube. Okay? And then, so you start with points collected on the field, which you have labels. And then you get the cube. And then you say, okay, get me the samples. Get me the time series given the data cube. Is it clear? Okay. So, now that we have the time series, and there's a lot, again, there's a lot of functions to plot time series, show time series, and again, I'm just concentrating on the most important bits. I invite you to continue uh, um, here in the introduction. Where is the introduction? My God. Uh, Still, please, uh, I suppose, oops, no, surely, sorry, escape. What is this guy doing to me? Sorry. Okay. Uh, view, exercise, introduction. So please go back to the introduction. We've just shown you a simple example of a data cube. I'll go into more details later. And I'm going to show you, uh, uh, well, there's some functions of sampling and so on, and uh, we're going to skip this. We have lots of functions uh, for describing samples. What I'm just going to say at this point, because of time, is that we take a lot of care with dealing with the samples. What do you mean by a lot of care? You know, and I think there's no secret for each one here, that samples are crucial for any machine learning application. But let me tell you, imagine you have 10,000 samples you collected. How do you know if these samples are good or not? What kind of tools do you use to diagnose the quality of these samples? 
Imagine, you have the samples. It may be time series or not time series, doesn't matter for the moment, just for the argument. How do you assess the quality of your samples? Nowadays, what tools are available? Please, come on, I'm sure you've done it. What do you use? Yeah. No, I, 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 I give you a bag of samples, okay? You get a bag of samples from Leandro. How do you know, how do you assess if these samples are good or not? You have samples, which means that you have values, can be time series or can be simply values of NDVI. Imagine simple NDVI. You have 10,000 NDVIs, and for each of these, you have the NDVI value and you have a label. How do you access... How do you measure if these samples are good or not? Uh, huh? Clustering, uh, yes, clustering, but normally what are tools available in these packages? The simplest tool is the obvious one, is uh, the validation, right? That's what you get from Hasti and Shibigiani in the book. You do a validation. Typically, you construct a validation of data, right or wrong? Go ahead. No, yes, uh, you agree or not? But what do you mean by validation? Va okay, the cr uh, cross-validation is established. I'm sure you have used it. I would be surprised if you don't. Uh, that's the standard thing you do. You pick up the samples and you say you have 10,000 samples. You separate them in five batches of 2,000, and then you use 4,000, the first batch for, for training your machine, and the second uh, 2,000 for evaluating. And then you change the, oh, let me take the first batch, second batch, third batch, fourth batch. Right? Who has never used this? No, that's validating the samples. Well, the samples according to the model. The point here is, you validate the samples for a classification. I'm arguing here, how do you validate samples without a model? No, 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 I'm, I mean, you have the sample. You don't have, a, I'm, I'm uh, mathematical. Now I'm with discussing statistics now. You have samples, in, you don't, you're not supposed to look at images. You just have the samples. How do you do? You look at the distribution of data, you look at this, and you look at cross, the, the cross-validation. But how can you find out which samples are good or not? If I compare them to the distribution to see if there's outliers. Okay, but then you assume, then there's a hidden assumption, that your samples fill the, fill the distribution. And that's the tough one there. Because you're taking a parametric a parametric assumption that your samples filter normal or binormal, whatever distribution, right? Yes, yes, of course. What I mean is that in sets we do a different approach. We use a non-parametric method called the self-organized map. We use self-organized maps, which have been very effective in terms of, the, in use distances uh, between time series using the dynamic time warping series. That's as much as I'm going to tell you now. And this is what I called finding the bad apples in the basket. This allows you to use a non-parametric approach to find out which samples are bad, which samples are good. For example, to reduce from 10,000 samples to 5,000 or 6,000 samples, which are which are consistent among each other. The rest you find in the book, which I'm not having time to cover. I'm just saying that there is no thing, there is nowhere else that this technique has been developed and available. Simple as that. Right, back to our introduction. My assumption, it's a non parametric my point is, it's a non-parametric assumption based on the digital time warping distance, which is the standard for measuring distances between t data cubes. And what happens, and I'm, I'm sorry not to be able, please read the book, because the self-organized map is a very standard machine learning method 
for clustering non data with non-parametric, not assuming any distribution. It's very effective, very much used in hundreds of applications in other areas, biochemical areas, very established. It's, it's not our invention. Our invention was just to make it available for various observation. But this is very established. We, we, I'm sorry to not to have time to full answer your question, but it's a non-parametric way. That's what we, we, we decided, we tested, oh, by model, by whole set of, of, of these kind of normality clustering functions, and they did not work well. Okay, can I ask you to go back now to the introduction chapter and please find training a machine learning model. Okay, if you found it, I hope you do, there is a uh, number three lines of code if you found it, anyone has not found it? Uh, the section is called <coughs> Training a Machine Learning Model. Okay, if you bear, have, has anyone not found it? Shout, please. Have you found it? Could you copy to the clipboard and copy back to your uh, your machine and then uh, put it there which should be here I'm sorry and let's look what we're doing I hope everyone can see my screen and the same code is in your screens it should be at least on mine it should be here so there's three lines of code. Okay. The first line of code is, does simply the following. It, uh, the samples had four beds, NDVI, EVI, and, and near and mid or infrared. That's the standard modis. I'm selecting just for the sake of facility two of the bands of the samples. So this function that you see there samples two bands, and if you run, it simply says, well, I have uh, out of my samples selected only the NDVI and the EVI time series. That's as much as it does, nothing very fancy. Okay? Then the next bit is more interesting. You write RF model, result, sit strain, samples, ML method, sits R4. Okay? And what do you expect that you get here? Any guesses? Now it's your guess. A model trained. Okay? If I run this, I have what? No, I have a model. Yeah, a function which is a model. Well, well spotted. It's a, it's a closure, to be more specific. It's 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 an it's an it's an object that contains a function. To be more precise, the recipe to the model. The to the model. Point. And what happens if I plot? If I now say plot, what happens? Something will appear. Something has appeared. And what is this something? Now you, you tell me what is this something. I'm sure. What is this? You can see in your screen, I hope. What, what is this? There's a, 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 if you get the same as one as I do, there's an EVI 16 somewhere. What, does, what is this? Okay. This is the order. This is the, 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 this is of course, these are the variables which are more important in the random forest model. 
But what in the heck is EVI 16? What is EVI 16? And the other one I have here is NDVI 21. You're getting there. You have, just to get you said, uh, the time series has 23, MODIS has 23 values per year. Okay? So your guess is, is order by, divide by what, uh, by 365, divide by 365 and you have what you want. It's actually the 16th date of your time series. Which means that your time series contains NDVI and EVI data. And the 16th date of the EVI variable is considered by the random force the most discriminatory, considering the classes here, which we, the, the, the classes, which I haven't actually talked about the classes, but we'll see that in a moment. Now, of course, I forgot and my apologies, if you please bear with me and write a summary, samples, two bands, two bands like this. If you write this, could you do this? This is, I, I should have shown it before. These are the samples, and again, uh, the proportion of the samples per class. Okay, so this is an agricultural area with cerrado, forest, pasture, soy corn, soy cotton, soy fallow, soy millet. And what happens is the random forest model, the random forest model has decided that to discriminate these classes with those samples, the EVI 16 is the most important variable, followed by the NDVI 21, followed by EVI 17, and so on. Now, Brian is excused because Brian knows the response, but I want to get your response. Let's suppose, back here, that you want to use not the random forest, but the extreme gradient boosting, like GBM, uh, synergize like, like GBM, or oh, extreme gradient boosting. What, is, what should we do? Which fun which new function you need to do? What do you think would happen here? I don't want to use random forest, I want to use extreme gradient boosting. What do I do? You instead of six random forest, you say 6xg boost. And it runs. Tell me another system existing on this earth that does this. No. Does this this way? Huh? No, SciML is not, <laughs> SciML is conceptual, you have to implement it. With time series. Okay. I, I really appreciate the effort and I really like the package. No, yeah, but the, the, prob the, prob the problem is not me. The problem is some people are telling me that you have to use a certain package. The, 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 I understand your point. Uh, you have to see what I'm coming from. Yeah. I'm coming from the point where people say, oh, uh, this package is fantastic and this package is fantastic and people boost about it in presentations without knowing their limitations. You got your point and I agree and I apologize. Okay, fair enough. Now again, if you want to use temporal convolution neural networks, you just write temp CNN here. Again, point taken Miguel, Miguel, right? Is your name, sorry. Daniel, sorry Daniel, but you see, it's how easy it is, you do temp CNN. Okay, so, to finalize, and we have just run out of time, I'm just going to uh, 
the last bit, I probably should just show you what it is uh, in the book because of time. I don't want to press your time. We're just about to finish. So allow me to show you on the screen and then you can reproduce it at home. Okay? Once you have the model, okay, and you have your cube, you can run a function called sits classify to produce your probabilities. The output of this is going to be a set of probabilities. Why a set of probabilities? Because that's the normal output of machine learning model. Okay, any doubts on this? For example, this is the probability that for that particular data cube, each pixel is classified as forest by the random forest model. Okay? And one can say, what can I do with this probability? Well, the first thing you say, can you do like Google Earth Engine does? Is you assign the class to the pixel with biggest probability. But you can do more. You actually can do various types of spatial smoothing. And there is another point which we like to say, we like to say time first, space later. So we like to say that SITS is a time first, space later package. Why time first, space later? Because up to this point, we have been working with time series. We have not used the spatial information. But after the probabilities, we can use the spatial information assigned by the classifier. It would take me more time uh, to show. I just want to point out, if I may, there is a whole chapter on Bayesian smoothing for post-processing. Again, hopefully, Daniel, I'm not seeing this available elsewhere. You can say it's in SciML. No, no, I'm, ser I'm serious. I look, at the, I look at the literature. You see, my point here is, um, my, my, my assumptions are I look at the literature published on, on journals, and I look at what has been published. And in this case, this is a paper which is coming out in remote sensing uh, this month. And this is a, a Bayesian smoothing approach for post-processing described here. There are other smoothing, Gaussian, and bilateral, and so on. Uh, this is a Bayesian, and again, uh, no, this is a long story argument for Bayesian smoothing. Uh, I think this is it for the moment. There's more here, if I may just point out the rest of chapters in the book. Machine learning, there is available uh, random forest, support vector machines, the traditional multilayer perception, and also the typical uh, emerging uh, time series processing called temporal convolutional neural network and also some attention-based models. There's one model particularly popular in some quarters called uh, lightweight temporal attention, which was developed by Vincent Sanfer Garneau and companies, uh, which is, I think, the light temporal attention encoder and the temporal convolution neural networks are roughly close to state-of-the-art. State-of-the-art is something moves every day, so at least close to what is the, uh, let's say, the cutting edge of research. Um, there is a full support for the validation and accuracy measurements, which are, I don't know if you know, a famous paper called Best Practices for Land Use and Land Cover Assignments by um, uh, Pontus Olofsson, Jules Foody, and Martin Harrod. It's a paper everyone should read. It's absolutely nothing to do with SITS. It's, it's a reference paper. We just implement the method here. 
There is a support for uncertainty and active learning in the model, so we do some uncertainty prediction. And uh, we also support ensemble prediction from multiple models, if you want, combining random forest, uh, uh, neural networks, and so on, and uh, also object-based time series analysis. So I end this by going back, before I thank you for your attention, I would end by going back to this uh, small diagram. So if you ever want to use uh, SITS or your students, it's very, very simple. If you understand this diagram, you can use SITS at any time. You create a data cube, regularize the data cube, get the samples, model, do the probability cube, do the smoothing, and you get them. So it's not, just to finish, it's not a tool per se, it's an end-to-end -end system. It's a system designed to get you there. So with that, I would like to open the floor for any final comments, and thank you very, very much. You have been a very attentive audience. I apologize to you and to everyone for being a little bit rough, but, you know, uh, old men are like this. You know, I think the oldest men in the room, I've been working with 45 years. Uh, please uh, bear in mind a little bit this uh, thing. You know that, hope that you don't take this personally or seriously, but thank you very much. So, any points, any questions, any doubts?